The doctor is in. Performance enhancement drugs have been around in sports for over 50 years, but not as widely publicized is the equivalent for mental athletes. In fact, you've tried one before, caffeine. We've all experienced a boost in alertness and stamina that comes with consuming a coffee, in my case, or a cola or energy drink. And you've also experienced dumb drugs too, alcohol, and weed, for example. But on the shelves of pharmacies, there's a pantheon of vastly superior mind-enhancing medications that can elevate your cognitive processes in the way that steroids transform pencil neck ectomorphs into superhuman hulks. The ethical question is whether they are fair. To me, I see them in a very different light to steroids. An athlete using steroids is doing it for their own benefit and at their own detriment. With smart drugs, I see us all as a society winning. If you create a new design, fascinating new piece of art, or a ground, groundbreaking patent, or code a new convenience app because your brain was overclocked on smart drugs, I see that as a collective good and the bearer of the physical cost as a hero. Morally, life isn't fair anyway. If you're born a turtle and you want a rabbit's life, shouldn't you have the choice? And legally, well, no college I know of has, has banned nootropics. Naysayers also like to point at potential side effect costs. But the way I see it, there are costs to not using and reaching your full potential too. Depression, midlife crisis, regret, jealousy, and there are huge financial costs to upward mobility too. So to me, it's not that simple. Of course, not everyone needs smart drugs. Ideally, they should be off the table if you haven't done your due diligence and corrected your lifestyle and practiced the other techniques already presented in this course. They should never be used as a substitute for lack of discipline and plain laziness. These are potent chemicals that should only be used when academic targets are simply unattainable and they should be used under the guidance and supervision of a medical doctor. These are three books I went through years ago looking for an edge, and I tried many of the herbs and chemicals the authors prescribed. Save yourself time and money, don't bother. Of all of them, the only one worth mentioning was the racetams. This is an example here, paracetam. The dose is one gram up to three times per day. I did find with this one a gentle push in increased mental clarity and colors seem more vivid. This one is safe enough to use without medical supervision, but as with all the other members of the non-prescription group, the effects are generally mild. You can get it online, which is how I came by this one. Here it is up close, a crystalline white powder with a mildly bitter taste you can mask in orange juice. Now, as we spoke earlier about motivation, the stress of academic school life often can lead to depressed mood or nervous anxiety that is resistant to just diet, exercise, and wishing it away. There are two over-the-counter natural products that can be considered to combat this, St. John's wort and the omega-3, 6, and 9 oils. Both need to be tried for a minimum of four weeks before determination of benefit or flop. Dosage is always on the side of the bottle and they're both inexpensive. I personally found Omega-369 seemed to make me sleep better, thereby improving my daytime mental resilience and putting a smile to my bedside manner. For more resistant cases, I would suggest seeing your family doctor for help. I see many students in my personal practice and two agents I find effective particularly is Effexor, Venlafaxine, and Wellbutrin, Bupropion, SNRIs. I personally like these two agents because of the norepinephrine kick they both have, enhancing alertness and memory, in addition to the serotonin boost that alleviates depression and anxiety. Pure SSRIs like citalopram and sertraline do not add, in my opinion, this extra spark. Modafinil is an old smart drug which used to be touted as the professor's helper. The idea behind it is that it would help you with PhD level work and focus. I personally have tried it and found it not much better than a good Starbucks. As an honorable mention, there is a precursor of it called Adrafinil, which your body metabolizes into Modafinil, which can be purchased online without requiring a prescription. 
I found it shamefully inferior to the actual modafinil, however. This is an example of both. The press pill is modafinil, and the powder here is a precursor, a drafinil. My first experience with smart drugs actually goes back much farther while I was in early medical school. I met a group of exchange German students who partied all through the year, then weeks before exam time would disappear and study day and night, then crush their exams. They freely told me later how they were able to work such freakishly long stretches. A weight loss drug called Denintil. I checked it out at a local pharmacy nearby and was surprised to learn that no prescription was required. You just had to ask for it as it was kept behind the counter. I remember it being quite effective for my mental stamina, though it completely killed my appetite. Years later, I discovered that it is related to many of the modern attention deficit disorder meds and used to be called greenies by baseballers who use them to increase their reaction times in play. Hands down, the king of smart drugs today are the ADHD psychostimulants, Ritalin, Concerta, Bifentin, Adderall, Dexedrin, Vyvanse, and there's more. The peculiar properties of these therapeutic agents is that even in individuals ostensibly not suffering from attention deficit disorder, you can still see a jump of a grade with regular use. For example, a SU student to a B student. Perhaps there is a little ADHD in all of us. Here's an example of Dexedrin 15 milligrams. It comes in small beads that delay how fast it's absorbed, so the drug essentially can last with you all day. Now, a little caution about boring your roommate's ADHD medicines. Too little knowledge can hurt you. When I prescribe a student a stimulant, I have in front of me their health history. I also begin low and titrate the dose up over time until I find the appropriate dose that fits that individual. I also see them every three months to check in on how they're making out and if any problems have poked through. When you borrow or buy these chemicals online, it's a crapshoot what you're getting. It may be an ill-fitting dose or inappropriate agent when a superior one is available that you just didn't know about. So how do you go about getting assessed to see whether you are a legitimate candidate for chemical help? My recommendation would be first to see a psychologist. In some cases, the problem may be performance anxiety or some other mood disorder holding you back. However, if the initial assessment points to ADHD, they will run a standardized test on you, which will definitively provide you your diagnosis. Once the diagnosis is made, you will then be directed to a prescriber, such as a psychiatrist or family doctor like myself. We then initiate treatment and bring you back periodically to evaluate effectiveness and fit. If you are considering any of these medications and wondering about potential side effects, come to my medical channel, youtube.com slash doctorsecrets. I have covered most of these drugs and their potential pitfalls. Your family doctor simply will not have time in an office visit to go through these agents with you exhaustively. And when researching side effects, also remember the percentages are typically very low. That is to say, you're more at risk speeding on the highway late to an exam. The benefits most often outweigh the risks once used sensibly and in a supervised capacity. They can be a powerful tool in your study arsenal used carefully, but keep a doctor on your study team. Thanks for watching. Get notified of new videos. Subscribe now. If you found this video helpful, support us by sharing it with all of your friends and throw us a like below. You're a star. Cheers and cheerio.